absolutely my pleasure to be here with you today and to have Dr. Corey Brown from the University of Georgia presenting our scope of lecture for 2014. In fact, Dr. Corey Brown is no stranger to many of you. Uh, either you have worked with Dr. Corey Brown over the years, or you have taught Dr. Brown, or you've been a student of Dr. Brown. So she has lots of connections in OBC. And, and I'm going to give you an introduction to Dr. Brown's uh, uh, career and, and life in, in short, uh, in a few minutes. But before I do that, what I would like to do at the moment is to give you an overview of the scope of lectures. Uh, many of you have attended scope of lectures over a number of years. Many of you have not, and this may be your first scope of lecture. Uh, if I give you a few introductory remarks about scope of lecture, then that would be followed by uh, Dean Stone making a presentation about the life of uh, Dr. Scofield. Uh, then I will call upon Dr. Brown to give the Scofield lecture, and this will be followed by a uh, pre uh, presentation of the medal by uh, the president of the Central uh, Veterinary Students Association. We will then go to the reception in honor of uh, Dr. Brown, which will be held uh, right in OBC cafeteria around 4 30 to 1. And I hope that you can join us because at the reception, we will also do presentation of awards to students who participated in the Graduate Student Research Symposium this, this morning and also this afternoon. So just to give you an overview of the Scofield Lecture, as many of you know, Dr. Francis Scofield was an influential pioneer of veterinary medicine in Canada. He made several seminal discoveries in the area of veterinary research, and the Scofield Memorial Lecture celebrates his life, his research, and his role as a motivational icon who has undoubtedly inspired the many subsequent research achievements here at OBC and also elsewhere. Schofield was a true maverick, both in his appreciation of scientific inquiry, but also in light of his commitment to addressing international issues um, and confronting social injustice. He was not only a brilliant and insightful researcher, but also an inspiring teacher. Dr. Schofield's life and his legacy provide us with the incentive achieve the highest standards of effort, intellect, and ethics, to practice evidence-based medicine, and to strive towards translation of our scientific discoveries into effective advances in both animal and human kind. Having said that, I would like to call upon Dr. Stone, Dean of OBC, to make a short presentation about Frank uh, Scope. And he's emphasized the short, but <laughs> <laughs> I think for people who didn't know Dr. Scofield, and I think there are more and more of those people as time goes on. It is helpful to get a little bit of a feeling of just who this man was. I know that some of the people who worked with him or had him as a professor have varying opinions because he could be quite strict and he was quite opinionated in how he treated people and the way that he conducted his, uh, his life. He did graduate from the Ontario Veterinary College. He entered in 1907 when Toronto was the seat of, of the Ontario Veterinary College. And it was located on Temperance Street in Toronto. So those of you from Toronto may not realize that. He had very little money. And this is what he wrote at one point. I rented a basement room for a dollar a month. I had no bed, so I slept with another student on his bed by paying him 50 cents a week. <laughs> in the first three months, I lived entirely on dry rye bread, cheap dried fish and water. From 6.30 to midnight every evening, I poured all my energy into my studies. When he graduated, he had polio while he was a student, but he, he graduated at the first of his class and was appointed to the health department where he completed a DBSC and looked at, at bacteriology of milk. And then he joined OBC as a junior faculty member. But he was asked in 1916 to go to Korea to work at Severance Hospital to help, treat, to help teach medical students. And he was, feeling, he was feeling like he wasn't doing his duty because he was not able to enlist in the Canadian military. And as you know, the World War I was, was um, on its way. And so he had decided that this would be some way that he could contribute. 
And he went there as a medical missionary, and one of the reasons was because he was such a persistent uh, fellow. While he was there, the Japanese had occupied Korea for, for quite a few years before he arrived. But on March 19th, in uh, 1919, the Koreans protested. There was quite a resistance movement against the Japanese occupiers. And because, partly because Dr. Schofield was a pathologist, he had cameras and he had film and he knew how to use this equipment and he took pictures of what was going on and he sent these uh, pictures to the wider world and helped explain just what was happening. And he took some of the only known photographs of a, of a major massacre that had happened. He was not thought of highly in the Japanese press and was called an arch educator at one point. And both the Presbyterian Church, who had sponsored his visit or his work in Korea, and the British government asked him to return to Canada. Part of the problem was he started writing about colonizations in other areas, such as in India, and so the British government was not as interested in hearing about that type of uh, <laughs> So he returned here and was on the faculty for quite a number of years and was definitely a parody medicine scientist. You can see where the school was. He actually rented the house that was across the street that's now the co-op house. It didn't have the bricks on it, it was stonework at that time. One, at one point, he actually lived in something of a closet here at OBC. We have some correspondence with him negotiating what it would cost for him to stay. He was, he was uh, very thrifty. He was quite a demanding teacher, and his students had mixed opinions, but they definitely said that they learned a lot from him. He wrote quite a number of, of different papers on education and on um, some of the first papers on salmonella and other diseases and animals. And he's most known for a paper that he wrote on what the cause of moldy, what the cause of bleeding gum disease in cows and identified the moldy clover as the cause. Later on, other scientists realized and identified that it was dicumer and within the moldy clover that was causing this, this disease. After he retired, at the age of 66, he returned to Korea and worked in the orphanages. He was acclaimed by the Koreans. He was given the key to the city of Seoul and made an honorary citizen. And when he died in 1970, he was buried in the Patriot section of the, of the National Cemetery. He's the only non-Korean buried in this section. And he has been considered a person of historic significance by Canada and, of course, by Korea. And the South Korean children learn about Frank Schofield. The Canadian children don't learn about Frank Schofield, but, but he is a part of their curriculum because he was so significant as to what he, how he helped them during the independence movement. There's a statue at the Toronto Zoo. If you go to the zoo of Frank Schofield that the Korean-Canadian community um, has placed there. And our own pathobiology building has the Schofield Memorial uh, Seminar, which uh, was partially funded by the Korean-Canadian community. So just to give you a bit of a, a flavor as to just who this man was, and why, when he died in 1970, this seminar series was initiated. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Sloan, for, and in fact, it was a short presentation. So thank you very much for the timely presentation. Now, what I'd like to do is to introduce our speaker, Dr. Corey Brown, from the University of Georgia. It is an absolute honor and pleasure to have you here in your alma mater. Yeah. Uh, when I sent my invitation to Dr. Brown and I said, would you be able to come to OBC in November 12th, I thought that probably she was going to say no because I knew how busy her schedule is like. And just to give you just a hint of how busy she is, she's actually going to have to take a uh, late flight tonight to Atlanta, going to Athens. 
And I believe you're leaving on Friday, headed to Uganda for a month, mm -hmm. you said? Uh, so we are absolutely honored to have uh, Dr. Brown here. She has received her BSc in Animal Behavior from McGill University and her DVM from here, from the vet hall, uh, from OBC in, should I actually say? Sure, date? yeah. In 1981, so she's OBC 1981, and that was why I said some of you have taught Dr. Brown, some of you have worked with her, and some of you are, <laughs> are, are students of Dr. Brown. So uh, she then completed a combined residency PhD in comparative pathology at the University of California at Davis. She was an assistant professor for a short while at Louisiana State University before moving on to uh, Plum Island to become uh, the head of pathology section at Plum Island, United States Department of Agriculture. Then she was called upon by uh, University of Georgia, the vet college at the University of Georgia, to become a tenured professor and also chair of the Department of Pathology at the University of um, Georgia. In, um, and that was in 96. In 2003, she was honored with the university's highest teaching award being named the Josiah Mace Distinguished Teaching Professor. Dr. Brown has worked internationally in building animal health infrastructure and diagnostics for <coughs> more than 25 years. She's conducted several workshops on basic field necropsy, necropsy and diagnostic techniques in 30 countries. And she actually gave us a rather list, long list of those countries. Many of them were in Asia, in uh, Middle East, in Africa. And like I said, she's headed to Uganda in a couple of days. Uh, Dr. Brown has served on many national and international expert panels on animal health and has received numerous awards for her efforts. And um, she has added that she's happy to spend working on animal health issues with veterinarians in a developing country setting. Mm -hmm. So without further ado, yeah. thank you very much. And um, I leave the forum to you. Uh -huh. Thank you, Dr. Cheyenne. Yeah. This is just a very huge honor for me to be here to present the Schofield Lecture. It was kind of a dream come true when I got the email from Dr. Sharif. So thank you very much for hosting me here. It's been a wonderful day. An interesting trip down memory lane, and we'll get into some of that. But I wanted to tell you that I teach general pathology, and I teach disturbances of circulation. So you know about warfarin. Basically, it was what Frank Schofield discovered. He discovered the dicumerol, and then it went to Wisconsin Agricultural Research Foundation, Warfarin. So I always tell the students at University of Georgia, it shouldn't be called Warfarin, it should be called Guelfarin. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, thank you. I almost didn't recognize Guelph when I came in here last night, although I do recognize this building. I remember very well the first day I walked through those doors. And I also remember very well the four years I had here that were really wonderful. So as I mentioned, I took a little trip down memory lane. I pulled out my yearbook. So I have photos of quite a few people. Uh-huh. So we'll start with this one. So there I am in the front row. Uh-huh. I always sat in the front row next to Don Socket. I don't know if any of you remember Don Socket, but... He sat next to me because he said I could spell real good. <laughs> yeah. And he went on to do great things at the University of Wisconsin. There is uh, Jim Clark, who is with CFIA, I believe, and Judy Gavin, who graduated at the top of the class. And she's in small animal medicine in Vancouver. At the end of our final year, Judy Gavin got the award for the best student in pathology. <laughs> And I got the award for the most humane treatment of small animals. <laughs> okay, our honorary class presidents. Uh, Dr. Patterson, I think his first name is Jim, right? Yes, uh-huh, and Dr. Leslie, they were our class presidents. I spent a summer working with Dr. Physic Sheard. This was my introduction to research, and what a wonderful introduction it was. Because, you know, he is very kind, but also firm, and so that really introduced me to all the ups and downs that you get with experiments. A great introductory mentor. But then I have to say, of all UGA, of all OVC faculty, my heart really belongs to Amrik Singh. 
because he kind of adopted me in my first year here. I worked with him for one summer. Uh, at the time I worked for him, he had an arranged marriage, his wife came over, and if you remember Amrik, he would work all hours of the day and night, so I said, I'll teach your wife how to drive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, she almost killed me. <laughs> <laughs> but we really had a wonderful time together, and I feel like Amrik was my good, has been my good friend for the last 35 years. I understand that Davinder is no longer with us, but I believe that Amit is on faculty here. Is that right? Are you here today? Okay, I'll have to find him later and tell him how much his mom and dad mean to me. Okay, pathology. I had great training in pathology when I started at California. All the faculty there said, did you already have an internship in pathology? <laughs> because I knew so much pathology. Because it's such great teachers here. Remember Reg Thompson? Can you sharpen that, please? Does anybody remember that? Was I, focus, focus the projector. <laughs> so I remember when he first became ill, I wrote a letter to him and said, you know, you really helped me decide that pathology was a career. And maybe, you know, I was one of 120, so maybe you don't remember me. But I want to thank you for the inspiration. And he wrote back to me, there's nothing wrong with my long-term memory. I remember you very well. And then, of course, Grant Maxey, yeah, who is uh, definitely a powerhouse within both veterinary pathology and laboratory diagnostics. And he taught me how to be a human being in a lecture. Yeah. <laughs> he always brought part of himself into it. Also in necropsy, you would quote Shakespeare in necropsy. One time we were doing a horse, and you said, oh, my kingdom for a knife. <laughs> Yeah, Brian Wilcock, talk about a way with words. This man, I mean, he can explain a colonic biopsy. You know, you just want to listen all day long. <laughs> uh huh. And of course, Ian Barker, who I think, I, I don't think he would be insulted if I said he was a delightful curmudgeon long before his time. <laughs> <laughs> so I just got great training, lots of support all the time that I was here. And I believe that this is going to continue into the future. We have two University of Georgia graduates who are now here on faculty, Nicole Nemeth, and I know Nicole very well. She did a residency with us, and she just breathes experimental design. She's going to be so successful. And then there's my Italian son, <laughs> who has left me. Leonardo Susta was in my lab since 2006. He won more awards than any other graduate student in our department ever. Uh, wrote more papers, did all my work, and now he's here. <laughs> These two are going to do so well at this institution, and I'm just thrilled that they've joined the faculty. But I think Frank Schofield would like it if we talked about the world. <laughs> so I better do that. <laughs> the world. The world has changed a lot since Schofield's time, and a lot of that has to do with globalization. So a definition here, and we've seen huge changes in the last 20 years, largely as a result of the initiation of the World Trade Organization. So in fact, Columbus was wrong. The world is flat now. <laughs> My son says, Mom, laugh at your own jokes. You're kind of weird. <laughs> 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 So the World Trade Organization started in 95, although there were a lot of things uh, working up to that. But the uh, institution of the WTO has really cemented regulatory processes in a way that makes political vagaries and caprices of trade really not so possible anymore. So it really is a much more level playing field. So we are, there is a lot more animals, animal products, people, services moving around the world. So now we are all connected in this complex tapestry of trade, transportation, technology, which we call globalization. And animal health is not immune to this. The World Trade Organization, as many of you know, actually took their standards for developing uh, regulations around the world. They took those, uh, the SPS, and they turfed them to the OIE, also known as the World Organization for Animal Health, but still goes by the term OIE. Why? Otherwise, it'd be, whoa. <laughs> so in 1995, WTO gave that SPS agreement. 
uh, to the OIE to interpret, and as a result, the OIE put together these manuals and codes about what are the standards that countries should follow in order to be able to engage in trade. So the OIE located in Paris, France, I believe there are 179 countries. Maybe there are some more now that are members. How many countries are there in the world? 193. So one time I asked one of the people at OIE what happened to those other 14 countries, that we'd have to buy them a cow to get them to join. <laughs> So here I am at the OIE, this was maybe 10 years ago, giving a talk. I think my adrenals that day were the size of golf balls, probably like about right now. <laughs> and here's Brian Evans, who was probably the longest serving CVO, many countries. Yeah, so he was the CVO, Chief Veterinary Officer of um, Canada for many years. So I was looking through my old pictures of when I was there, and I found this picture. So there I am outside the OIE with Brian Evans. And then it, the caption is Bob and Brian, OIE. Does anybody know who Bob is? That's Bob Clark. OK, thank you. Yeah, so because of these international regulations, you know, we're all in this together. There are more diseases moving around. Yeah, you want some of my Campylobacter? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So to talk about these regulations, there's about 2,000 pages of standards. So I think for the next 35 minutes, I'll just go over all of those standards. <laughs> want to do that? Not. OK, but I think what all these standards do is they say, this is what the health system, the animal health system in a country should look like. And I, to me, this is the gestalt. So you have the policymakers up here, the federal people, they're the ones, and they have to have political will, common sense, and funding. Then you have to have a field force with good expertise. You certainly have that in this country. And then you have to have a laboratory with excellent expertise. You also have that here. So Canada has a very well-functioning system. And of course, it's all tied together by communication and surveillance. Now, this whole system is dedicated to the public good, right? So you know the difference between public good and private good. So the National Animal Health System focuses on public good. So that would be the transboundary animal diseases, zoonotic diseases, food safety. Whereas the private good, these are the diseases that are going to cause problems in, so, in, a, in a person's pocket. So we're talking about bovine respiratory disease, canine parvovirus, equine colic. So it's a public-private system that works together, and it works very well in both the US and Canada, and I'll show you how. So what we have here is, so this, this national system is dedicated to the public good. So remember those diseases. And I was looking through my yearbook, and several of us from OVC 81 have gone into this national system. Jim Clark, who's with CFIA, Tom Popper, also with CFIA, Carolyn Inch in Ottawa, and Ed Creighton, just to name a few. Oh, yes, and there's Paul Shadbolt, who was an expert on food safety, and we lost him way too soon. So that's the whole public good system. And then what we have that makes our system so strong in the US and Canada is we have a private field force that's actually connected to the national system through accreditation and awareness of the public good diseases. So that makes our field force really very large, and this is what is missing in most of the developing world. So we've got people who, are, uh, who train the private force, and that's a lot of you on faculty here, but also many from my class. Royce Charbonneau, who now goes by George, and he's a big wig within the American Association of Swine Veterinarians. I saw him at a meeting recently. And then Ken Bateman, my classmate, I think he retired from OVC recently. He probably looked a little different than this picture. <laughs> That'll happen in 35 years. <laughs> so they are doing a lot of training of, of private veterinarians. And then I wanted to show this picture of Tim Zaharchuk. So Tim was in my class. We were often in labs together. We were often lab partners. And, um, 
I wouldn't say he graduated at the top of the class, but he had wonderful soft skills. He had a great personality. I saw him at an Ontario Veterinary Medical Association meeting maybe 20 years ago, and I'm pretty sure he's the first person in my class to be a millionaire. <laughs> so we've got this system that works together, and we certainly don't want to leave out the laboratory people, lots of people in uh, my class went into laboratory in Britain, Marina Brash. Are you here, Marina? Hey. <laughs> yeah, Brit Brash, Britain, and Brown all became pathologists. <laughs> yes, and also Scott McEwen. Yes, he became a, a, a very well-respected pathologist. So Guelph has produced their share of people in all of these arenas. Oh, and Rebecca Baker, who I think went into clinical pathology. Is that right? So, but this talk is about the world, and especially the developing world, and it's this part of that whole triangle that does not function well in the developing world. So what I thought I would do is just give you a few vignettes and cross-cultural experiences that have happened with me as I have gone around the world, so we're going to sit and drink three cups of tea together. Some of my other classmates have also gone into development. Brian Bedard is with the World Bank in Washington, D.C. And of course, John McDermott. I think he was, the, he was a really bright guy in uh, vet school. And look, he was the youngest person in our class, and he was starting to get gray even then. <laughs> and I've crossed paths with John many times in Nairobi and elsewhere in the world. And then Sandra Vocati, who has worked for many years in South America. But I think about working, what? Working overseas is a lot about cognitive dissonance. You see things differently. And understanding that cognitive dissonance can really help you bridge the gap and also can teach you much more about yourself. So how many countries are there in the world? 193, and each one of those countries has its own national culture. And so if you know where your own culture is, you can use the GPS to see where the other culture is and you can compare. I'm going to give you some examples. Geert Hofstede is a sociologist, anthropologist, internationalist from the, uh, from the Netherlands. And he has developed a very nice system for comparing cultures based on certain parameters. So we all know about culture, the things you see up here, these are bows, handshakes, where you blow your nose, and so on. And we tend to be aware of those as we go to another country, but maybe what we're not aware of is these components, these mindset components, deep cultural differences, and this will really trip you up. This will sink you if you don't understand some of the national differences. And it has been compared to computers talking to each other. So one culture might be uh, an IBM, and it has to interact with uh, a Mac operating system. Well, you have to know how to make the patches in order to get through. So it's called software of the mind, this national culture. And I thought I'd give you some comparisons. This power distance is a, can be a big difference in cultures, and it can really trip you up. Also, individualism versus collectivism, and then this quality of life. I have a, a couple of examples. Power distance. How much do you respect and value authority? Do you question authority? Do you follow directions blindly? They did a study about airline crashes, and they found out that a, a greater percentage of airline crashes were because both the pilot and the co-pilot were from high power distance cultures. <laughs> so as they're coming in to land, the air traffic controller says, OK, runway 8 is open. And the pilot's thinking, well, I thought there was a plane on runway 8. But he told me to land. I better. <laughs> and then the co-pilot also sees a problem, but the co-pilot doesn't want to challenge the pilot, and so on. So now airline companies actually never have people from high power distance together in the cockpit. Where do you think US and Canada are on this? We tend to be pretty low. Uh huh. I think Israel is the lowest. <laughs> Canada and the US are also pretty low. 
So I was doing a workshop in the Gambia, which is a little sliver of a country inside of Senegal. And this workshop was for veterinarians throughout English-speaking West Africa. Here we all are. You can see the two Americans there. <laughs> I was working with Linda Logan, who was with USDA APHIS at that time. And we were going to do a necropsy training session. So we arrived on a Friday, we got everything set up on a Saturday, and the chief veterinary officer of the Gambia said, what would you like to do on Sunday? And I said, well, I would really like to go to the market and buy some of that fabulous West African fabric. He said, okay, meet my technician at noon tomorrow. So here's the technician, Mr. Bajani, and we picked him up at noon on Sunday. We went to the market, had a fabulous time, bargained, it was just so great maybe an hour or two there, and then uh, I'm ready to leave. I said, well, Mr. Bajani, we will drop you, we'll, we'll drive you home. He said, I'm not going home. So I'll take you wherever you want to go. I need to go to the hospital. Why? Are you sick? No, my wife had a baby this morning. <laughs> but he was so happy throughout the course. It was not, it was not the way we would think of it. So here we have this power distance. Now, not all the countries are in this Hofstede analysis. So I picked the country that I thought was closest to the Gambia. And you see the difference in power distance. Also, there's a big difference in individualism versus collectivism. You know, we are strongly individualist. So we would say, heck no, I'm not going there. I'm taking care of myself today. But his boss told him to go take care of the foreigner. And he wanted to make everybody happy because it's a collectivist mentality. And so for him, it was normal. So another example, let's see. What are we going to do next? I guess that would be masculine versus feminine. And you know, we think of some cultures as being very masculine and others as being you know, feminine or feminist. But actually, this is more like career success and quality of life. I have two examples here. Here's one. This is a Brazilian veterinarian who lived, he and his wife lived in my house while he was doing his MPH at the University of Georgia. When he finished his MPH, he got a PhD program in Denmark. They went over there. And while they were there, his wife had a baby. In Denmark, the man gets three months of paternity leave paid. And so he was worried about his career. And he said, he went to his boss and he said, my wife is very capable. And she really doesn't need me at home for three months, so I'm going to come back and work. And his boss said, no, you cannot. Because if you do that, everyone will just assume that you have marital problems. And this is your time. You have to spend it with your family. Can you imagine that happening here? <laughs> so there is Denmark and the US. I want to tell you a little bit about the sabbatical I did last year. I had a Fulbright fellowship to go and work at Jordan University of Science and Technology. It, they have, it's a totally science school. They have medicine, engineering, veterinary medicine, and it's the only school of veterinary medicine in Jordan. It's also kind of a science hub for the whole region. So I was there for six months. The school is up in Irbid. Do you see a problem there? to right on the border with Syria. So here's the view from my dorm room. There's the college, big hospital. People come from all over the Middle East to go to this hospital. And I could hear the bombs on the border every night because the government was bombing the border to keep the rebels from moving into Jordan. The people in Jordan were very sympathetic to the Syrians. They, say they, they said they're our brothers. They were actually taking in so many Syrians, finding them jobs. Uh, the, the ambulances would go to the border every night to pick up the wounded Syrians to take them to the Jordanian hospital. The uh, veterinary hospital is really very good there. And here's a, a happy patient going home. But the, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about Jordan here is to talk about masculine feminine. And we all, often think that Arab cultures, they're just very masculine. And the, the women don't get to do anything, and the, the children maybe aren't cared for very well. But I found the exact opposite. Here we are in necropsy. This is my host. This is the associate dean for research. And here's his son. 
And here's a Brucella placenta. <laughs> <laughs> so during public school holidays, all the faculty bring their children to work. Not because they don't have babysitters at home, but just because they like having their children around them. So during the public school holidays, all the men brought, brought their children in, and they just sort of took over the campus. They took over some of the labs. I would go into the histo lab to use the microscope, and I would have to ask the technician, Mohammed, do you think you could ask your son to, move, to you know, leave the microscope so I could look at my slides today? Uh, this is another thing I can't imagine happening in the U.S. or Canada, a tremendous focus on family, which I found very refreshing. So here we have, so the, it's a traditional Arab society, but in fact they're much more feminine than we are. Also, as you see the individualism scale there, the Jordanians are very much collectivist people, so they were just going to help all of the Syrians, even though it was stretching their infrastructure uh, really far. So you're probably wondering now, well, what about Canada and the U.S.? Where, do, where are they on these parameters? Would you like to see? Ah. Okay, so here you are, and I have put the U.S. in comparison here. So let me see. In comparison, you are less individualist. You have a greater focus on quality of life, and you're more pragmatic. Not bad, huh? But I did promise to show you some lesions, so I'll do that. Here is a Syrian refugee who's working with a big flock of sheep and goats. And we heard that some of the sheep were sick, so we went out to see. Now, the Bedouins do something interesting with their animals in that they take a sheep or two, and they raise them in the tent with them, and they put bells in their ears. So that then when the sheep and goats go out, they always know where they are and they can call them back. So as we were look, examining this one sick sheep and eventually killing it, this particular sheep would not leave me alone. I did not know that sheep could have such a personality. <laughs> yeah, it was like a dog. It was really wonderful. So here we have some oral erosions. Want to see more? Okay, oh, look at the dental pad. Ugh. I don't think I want to eat. Yep, underneath that big fat tail. You know, they're all fat tail sheep there. You know what the soldiers call the fat tail sheep in Afghanistan? <laughs> J-Lo. <laughs> Isn't that awful? Yeah. You know, and some of the fat tail sheep, are so, they have such fat tails that um, they actually have to have help in breeding. And I know when, <laughs> when I was in the clinic, uh, uh, a herder brought his prize uh, sheep. Well, it was an Awasi sheep, and he was, it was a ram. And he was so proud of this ram, because this ram could breed the females without getting help lifting that fat tail. <laughs> that was special. So here we have dinorrhea. So oral erosions, diarrhea, severe oral erosions throughout the oral cavity. Uh -huh. This is the proximal colonic lymphoid patch with multiple areas of hemorrhage and ulceration, mostly over lymphoid follicles. And then in the lung, there were these multiple areas. So this was a beginning bronchointerstitial pneumonia. The disease? This is PPR. Uh huh. Which you know the whole world calls PPR because you know only the French and the Canadians can pronounce French. <laughs> uh, so here's the pathogenesis of PPR. So it comes in and it replicates in the lymphoid tissue of the gut and also the epithelium, and then it gets out into the environment. And then once it makes a mess of the gut, it actually goes to the lung, and you get this bronchointerstitial pneumonia, not unlike canine distemper. So <laughs> this disease is like a cross between Rinderpest and canine distemper. Well, it is another morbidly virus. And this disease is just moving through the world, and we really need a good campaign to control it. But we can't get political will for sheep and goats. The developed countries, you can't get them interested in the sheep and goats, unfortunately. So a lot of camels. So this poor camel, 
was living in a peach orchard. There were three camels, and they ate all the peaches, but then the pits didn't disintegrate. <laughs> so all the senior vet students, each one got a chance to pull about 10 kilograms of peach pits out of the compartment. Yeah. And they went home happy. And this is camel pox. Uh -huh. And here's a kid with a camel. So I, I learned some Arabic before I went there, and I tried using it while I was there. And I stopped to take a picture of the, these two little boys with the camel. And he looked at me and he said, uh, you don't speak good Arabic. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I felt like, well, you little shit, at least I'm trying. <laughs> but I had learned modern standard Arabic. And the dialects of Arabic in the different parts of the world are so different that he was telling me I was speaking good Arabic, which he could not understand. <laughs> so it was another cultural divide. So besides using that Hofstede scale for determining you know, cross-cultural conundrums and how they arise, something else that I do when I go to other countries is I go to the CIA World Factbook and look at key parameters about a country and compare them to my own. And that gives me a good frame of reference for understanding overall socioeconomic and um, other things in a country. So I want to tell you a little bit about the work I've done in Afghanistan. As you know, the US government has been very involved there for a long time. I'd like to say we've made good progress, but I'm just not sure. But with animal health, it has been a huge privilege for me to be involved. I think I've been there maybe 10 times, several programs. So here is what the CIA World Factbook says about Afghanistan. And what I know from this is that if I lived in Afghanistan, I'd be dead. <laughs> right? And I probably couldn't read. But look at this. 20% of the GDP is agriculture, and almost 80% of the populace works in agriculture. So I see that as a huge opportunity. You've got all these people working in, in agriculture. If you can improve their capacity, you can improve the output and increase the amount of GDP that's due to agriculture. So that's a positive thing. Most of the projects that I've done there have been with the US government. So I stay at the embassy in a freight container. They call them hooches. So here's some of the freight containers. And I was there, I don't know, two or three times. And I went to my host and I said, I think this is false advertising. <laughs> I've never seen either of those two men. <laughs> but the work that I do is usually out at the Central Diagnostic Laboratory. We first went there in 2006 to do some necropsy training sessions. This is one of the very first ones we did. We didn't have our boots yet, so we tied plastic bags on our feet. And maybe some of you know Dr. Afzal Masoudi. He is an Afghan. He works as a pathologist in Toronto at one of the universities, I think. So here we are. Um, what an eye-opener it was. And I find this often happens when I go to a country to give training. You have all your continuing education materials ready to deliver. And you get there and you realize how they're so irrelevant. Because here are three highly intelligent, dedicated Afghan veterinarians, and they had never seen the inside of an animal. I mean, we're talking about this is the rumen, this is the small intestine. We are so very lucky. And we need to remember that when we go overseas to do work, is that we need to give them information that is very useful. Um, here's the director of the diagnostic lab. We, we used all the animals that we used were then, uh, we ne did necropsies and then the meat went to the cafeteria, which made the workers there very happy every time we showed up. <laughs> because instead of their rice and beans every day, they actually got meat for lunch. Another cultural thing, uh, we would buy the sheep and then hire the local kids to watch the sheep until we were ready to do the necropsy. And I remember in particular this little boy, the sheep would follow him everywhere. And he had an empty Coke bottle, one of those plastic bottles. And he would just turn around and go, whack, on the sheep's head. And the sheep would follow him. And they'd turn and go, whack. And at first I thought, oh, he shouldn't be doing that. And then I realized the sheep didn't care. Yeah, the sheep was just very dedicated to him. So 
Oh. So this diagnostic lab had not had an accession in 25 years. And so after we, gave, we were in the middle of the first necropsy course, and there was a highly pathogenic avian influenza, H5N1, was reported in Pakistan, which is pretty nearby. And so we figured sooner or later it would come into Afghanistan. So everyone was on the lookout. We got a call from the Ministry of Health. A pigeon has fallen from the sky in northern Afghanistan. So we got excited, and everybody put on their PPE, and we did the necropsy and had lead shot in its breast. <laughs> Yes! We made a diagnosis. So I stayed after this course to continue to look at chickens as they came in, and sure enough, we did find highly pathogenic avian influenza. There was a, uh, here's some subcutaneous edema in the cervical area that occurs with, with HPAI, and this did turn out to be H5N1. There was a temporary FAO lab set up there. And there are the lungs. So we, together, we informed the chief veterinarian. You would never make a diagnosis of a disease in another country. Everybody knows that, right? You go to the chief veterinary officer. You're there with his permission, first of all. You go to the chief veterinary officer and say, we think we have this disease, and then he looks at the results. So uh, he made the announcement. But, but let me tell you, I felt pretty darn smart. <laughs> yeah, I would say the word would be smug. And as we were driving back to the embassy from the lab, I saw this little boy selling eggs on the sidewalk. And I thought, oh my goodness, what this diagnosis and this disease is going to do to the microeconomy. Fortunately, they got rid of it shortly, but I can imagine over the next two weeks, he probably didn't have many eggs to sell. People weren't buying them. Uh, I did go back to the embassy and, and get put on Tamiflu. And uh, I need to tell you that it turned me into a real witch. <laughs> you know, it has psychomimetic effects, right? I couldn't stand myself. <laughs> so some other diseases we saw there. Where's Dr. Nodge? Yes, this is the virulent chicken adenovirus 4. That was, I think was first described in Pakistan with the liver lesions, and they call it lychee heart disease. Uh -huh. And here's Newcastle with a mottled spleen, another mottled spleen, some diseases. I did promise to show you lesions from around the world, didn't I? Yeah. Oh, and so I have the pathogenesis of Newcastle. You know, it infects macrophages, so it's going to replicate in those macrophage organs. And then the macrophages go wild, they spew cytokines, and the chicken dies. <laughs> Uh, Liberia is a country that's been in the news recently, and I thought I would share a couple of experiences from this country. I was there a year and a half ago with Veterinarians Without Borders. We were training community animal health workers because there are no veterinarians in Liberia. And at the time we were there, there were only about 100 MDs in the country. A big problem in Liberia is that they, you know, they had this terrible war that Charles Taylor, he he recruited, young, he recruited children and then got them high on drugs and made them go back and kill people in their villages so they could never go home. It's a terrible thing that happened. He made a mess of Liberia, and then he went to Sierra Leone and did the same thing. So these two countries are extremely poor, and they have eaten all of their livestock. Animal source foods are very rare, so I can understand why they eat bushmeat. Cognitive stunting, big, big problem in children in Liberia. So here we are training community animal health workers. They all took the chickens home to eat them. Oh, disease? Yeah, fall pox. Uh -huh. And so um, there was a little bit of a fight over who was going to take the chickens home. So I decided when we did the goats, I better do some preemptive stuff. So I went to the cafeteria lady and said, you know, can, can you use the goat meat? So she cooked up the goat meat for, for lunch. That was good. Yeah, bush meat, very popular. Oh, yeah, so I mentioned <laughs> Liberia has no veterinarians. So this is Festus Sama, and he is now doing a veterinary degree in Uganda, and I saw him when I was there last month. He had some real horror stories to talk about what is happening in Liberia with Ebola that just really tore at my heartstrings. This is Peter's Craig, who is a community animal health worker in Liberia. And uh, he's looking for any extra cash he can get to help support his mother and his five brothers and sisters. 
So he's often hired by veterinarians without borders to do small things. Um, his father died of rabies. He watched his father die of rabies. There is no post-exposure prophylaxis in Liberia. Nobody's vaccinated. And so we just think that, to me, that's cognitive dissonance. It's so different. Well, I think I'll end with this story from Jordan. Nabil Halat, who is my, was my host in Jordan, I've worked with Nabil for many years. He's the founding dean of the Jordan University of Science and Technology. He's a bit of an elder statesman uh, in that college. And, you know, I, I think he might just be the next minister of agriculture. So here we are after necropsy, and he, he is advising a couple of uh, wealthy Arabs about diseases in their sheep, which, by the way, was ovine pulmonary adenomatosis. Where's Sarah? Yes. <laughs> uh -huh. So we do, we've done a lot of work together, and one morning he picked me up. We were going somewhere, and he said, how would you like to go have coffee in a Bedouin tent? And I'm thinking, well, I had breakfast already, but you know, I can always use an extra coffee. I was thinking, it must be a chain. <laughs> Duh. So he pulled off to the side of the road, said, hello, I have an American here. And so these people invited me into their tent, and I sat and talked with them for quite a while. Three generations in the tent. This little girl is very proud of all the English she's learned. She goes to school. She knows more words in English. I can't think of very many American seven-year-olds that know several words in another language. This little boy had a, uh, a goat kid, like maybe a four-day-old kid. And he had it in his arms, and then he gave it to me to hold, and I was holding it for a while, and I was having such a good time, and it got very agitated. And I asked, I asked Nabil, I said, what's going on? He said, he's afraid his father is going to give you the goat. <laughs> Jordanians have a wonderful sense of humor. This is one of the brothers that was there in the tent that day. He got a call on his phone, and then he hung up, and they all started laughing. And I said, what are you laughing about? And he said, <laughs> I just called ISIS to tell them, ISIS, to tell them there's an American here. They can come and kidnap you. <laughs> <laughs> So we were, as we were getting ready to leave, this is the head of the household. He said, no, please don't leave. I want to slaughter a sheep and cook a special meal for you. You're the first American I've ever had in my tent. And so um, I said, well, I'm going, when I go back to America, what's the message you would like me to take? And he said, please invite all of your friends to come and have coffee with me in my tent. Well, you know, we all have days when we think about why do we do what we do? Who do we work for? Well, I know that my paycheck comes from the University of Georgia. But, you know, in my heart, I feel like I work for this person or people like this all around the world. Those dedicated, compassionate keepers of livestock that supply us with the, the food we eat. So thanks for sharing. Thanks for staying for all of this, for this little trip around the world of lessons and lesions. I want to thank you very much. I, re I remain very humbled and grateful to be a graduate of this fine college. And I guess you know, that teaching award wasn't really sufficient you know, for you know, your uh, capacity <laughs> and, and ability to 
convey your message to your audience on absolutely captivated. So having said that, you have to basically go through the motion, which is to open the forum for any discussions, any questions for Dr. Brown before heading to a uh, presentation of the scope of that. So the uh, forum is open for discussion and questions. Yes? You know, there are 193 countries in the world. I've been to maybe, I don't know, maybe not even a quarter of them. And there's so much more to learn. And I'm not sure I go places to help people. I go places because I really enjoy getting to know other people. And if they get helped, what I do is really pretty selfish. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, any place that's different, I enjoy. Oh, we, uh, so I have a joke that I often start off workshops with. What do you call someone who speaks three languages? Trilingual. What do you call someone who speaks two languages? Bilingual. What do you call someone who speaks one language? American. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're so spoiled as English speakers because the whole world wants to speak English and everywhere we go there's someone to help us. I always try and learn a few phrases, you know, thank you, where's the bathroom, things like that. Okay. I'd like to know when, when you started doing that, when you started doing this, when you started doing this, and what started, what made you go Well, I actually started it while I was here at OVC. I spent the summer between my third and fourth year traveling through Southeast Asia and then doing some work in New Zealand. And with such an international faculty here, there was a lot of an encouragement and support. And my parents always traveled and so they were big supporters too. Any more <laughs> questions for Dr. Brown? Yes, Laura. Yeah, but you know, this is home. Yeah, it's always nice to come home. Yes. So, with all the things that don't happen here, have you still learned about all of these in med school or the new diseases that you still have? Hmm. Well, there's, yeah, there's always emerging diseases. Yes, we all have good job security in, in that regard. Uh, I mean, when I went to vet school, we didn't have bovine spongiform encephalopathy anymore. Grant, help me. What are some other diseases that have emerged? Porcine epidemic diarrhea. Yes. Yes, that just emerged when I was a senior. Yes, we were deluged with diarrheic dogs. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure that the places are so dangerous. You know, to go as an animal health worker where you're dealing with other veterinarians from that culture, it's, we th I know we it, you hear in the news about how awful Afghanistan and Iraq are, but that's because we hear about what the soldiers are doing there. But to go as an animal health worker is a bit different. I, I have never felt in danger. Except, <laughs> this, is, this is, I was in Amman. I was there for a meeting. So I was up in Irbid most of the time. Then I went to the capital city. I was at a meeting, and the meeting went late. 
And so it's about 11 o'clock at night. I was walking back to my hotel, and I thought, well, I'll just take this little shortcut. So I was going through an alley, and I see a guy trotting up to me, and I thought, okay, this is it. I've never been mugged, but this is going to be my experience. <laughs> uh -huh. And he ran up to me and said, I can tell you're a foreigner. I want to help you. Are you lost? Can I walk you to your hotel? <laughs> Would that happen in Atlanta? I don't think so. <laughs> We really have uh, enough of your, your talk and, and, and this interaction, but any good thing is going to have to come to an end. And unfortunately, this is almost the end. Uh, and I would like to call upon uh, Laura Omelianga. I practiced it many, many times. <laughs> so uh, she's president of the Central Veterinary Students Association. I would like to call upon Laura to come over and make the presentation of the medal. I didn't know I was going to get a medal. So here we go. <laughs> it's a real medal. <laughs> so on behalf of the Ontario Veterinary <laughs> College and of course um, Dr. Schofield, who I'm sure would agree with the <laughs> award, I'm happy to present you the Schofield Medal. Thank oh you. my. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Thank you, Laura. Thank you very much. So well, thank you very much again, Dr. Brown, for the wonderful uh, presentation. Um, this concludes our school field lecture. There's a reception in the cafeteria, and I would strongly encourage everyone to come over. We're also going to have the worst presentation in the cafeteria over the next half an hour. Mm -hmm.